good evening, whatever it is, wherever you are, you to you. So, I was thinking about something recently, and I've uploaded a video for a little while, so I thought I'd just give you a very quick update on what's going on, how things are progressing, and cover a topic I wanted to cover for a little while. So, this video will be a little bit techy, but should be quite easy to follow, so don't turn off yet, hopefully. <laughs> So basically, uh, yeah, caravan's going great. We're now halfway through the racing season. Um, caravan and awning have both performed brilliantly um, and have provided comfortable, clean, dry accommodation. Uh, everything's what it needs to be. The cooker cooks the breakfast and dinner and, you know, running water's lovely and everything that the caravan does works well. I've had no hassles, which considering that the caravan's made in 1985, so it's, you know, 28 years old, no more than that, sorry, 30 something, I can't bother to work out, 33 years old. I think it's remarkable. And for the money paid, for £500 paid for it, and just a little bit of money to, uh, to modify the awning into becoming a pit garage, so the whole end unzips. Absolutely fantastic value for money. Thank you so much to the chap on Facebook I bought it from. Everything does exactly what it was designed to do. So the caravan side of things is continuing to work perfectly. Um, I'll pop a little photo up that shows our pit garage when we're array racing. We've now got some nice flooring down, the out power outlets, power the laptop and the lights and things like that um, in the awning rather than having to run an extension cable through from inside so we don't have to leave the door permanently open, which is helpful if it's a very warm day so the heat from the awning when the bikes come in from a run doesn't flood in and make the caravan really hot. So yeah, works really well. So brings us back to the subject I intended to talk about, and that's tow cars. So Back in the day, there was a simple choice. You had a manual or an automatic, and your choice of the manual typically would have been a four-speed or five-speed manual and a three-speed or four-speed automatic. Sometimes it was referred to as three-speed with overdrive, but ultimately it meant the same thing. It meant four forward gears, and some were just straightforward three-speeds. So going back to when I started driving, there was plenty of what you'd call typical tow cars around. Now I, start, I was born in 1978, so I'm 40 years old. I started driving immediately in 1995, the second I turned 17. And at that time, a typical tow car would have been a Ford Sierra, a Vauxhall Cavalier. Um, there was a smattering of French cars that are quite popular for the diesel engines. Quite a few people towed the Citroen CXs, BXs and things like that. Um, the odd VW Passat, but typically predominantly British vehicles. Um, so the five-speed manual and um, three-speed automatic would have been the pretty standard choices. Now that was all you had and you would have the advantage with the automatic of the torque converter giving you something called torque multiplication which meant they were much easier to pull away on a hill and much better at hill starts than the manuals were because the manual would have to slip the clutch a lot potentially burning it but then of course you had limited gears you only had three forward sometimes four forward gears so you always had a gear less than you did with the manual, which meant you had to rev the engine a bit harder before it shifted into the next gear, but of course it did all that for you. The only thing you needed to consider typically was putting a transmission cooler if you had a heavier caravan or a heavy duty vehicle, but other than that they pretty much worked as they did. They weren't very efficient, so they did have a habit of burning through a lot more petrol than the manuals, and of course the gear selections didn't help that either. Now these days, fast forward to now, uh, it's obviously 2018, and I'm in, again, something now that would be a typical tow car. It's probably slightly towards the older end of what a lot of people tow with, but it is by no means an old car. It's not, well, it's barely nine years old. It's just turned over nine years old. So it is in no way, shape or form anything other than a modern car. And this is a 2009 Volvo V50R design. And this one has a six-speed manual. So, in terms of gearboxes, this was a six-speed manual, uh, sorry, six-speed auto, the other option would have been a six-speed manual, sorry, this one's a six-speed auto, don't know why I said manual there, but there you go, I did. So, in terms of gearboxes, you don't lose out on the number of gears. There was a five-speed auto offered, although I don't believe there was ever a five-speed manual offered with these cars, but that was with the earlier five-cylinder engines, and I'll come to the differences in a moment, but yeah, six-speed, so whether it's automatic or manual, you really don't have any penalty in terms of gear selection. The gearing is very much the same. It pulls 2,200 RPM at 70 miles an hour. Um, the gear ratios are nicely chosen. First, it's probably ever so slightly lower than it would have been in the manual. 
partly to allow the car to creep because this has got something called a double clutch gearbox in it. So although it's automatic, it doesn't have a torque converter, but in a second I'll get to what that means. Um, so yeah, the gear ratios are very well chosen for towing. I just stick it into D and it tows perfectly. Originally I started towing it using fifth on higher speed roads, it simply isn't necessary. It sits perfectly happily in sixth, 1800 RPM at 60 miles an hour and it's more than capable of swapping gears as required. Just leave it in drive and forget anything ever happened. It will sort it all out perfectly. But the thing is now, there are many different types of automatic gearboxes. Manuals are still the same as they've always been. A manual's a manual, there really hasn't been any change there, except for one, but we'll cover that in a moment. But with automatics, there is now double clutch gearboxes. That's the gearbox in this car, that's things like DSG gearbox with Volkswagens, then you have roboticized manuals, which are still automatic. That's things like the Maserati Cambio Corsa and uh, the BMW SMG earlier gearboxes. I believe SMGs are now double clutch, but the earlier ones were, were a roboticized manual. The Alfa Romeo Celis Speed is also one. I mean, Alfa Romeo has never been massively popular for towing, although the 156 and 166 did do a reasonably enough job within the realms of a two litre standard sized car. So, you know, some people have towed with 156s with the Selly Speed box, and you also have continuously variable gearboxes. Uh, that's things like the Audi Sport Tronic, the uh, CVT is also used in the um, in the Nissan Qashqai. I always want to call it the Nissan, Nissan Kumquat, but Nissan Qashqai. Uh, and each gearbox has its own advantages and disadvantages. So we'll start with what is rapidly becoming the normal. Of course, the traditional auto was an epicyclic. We start what's rapidly becoming the standard, which is the double clutch gearbox. Now, that's what this car has. It's not like a manual gearbox at all. Basically, you have two gearboxes in the car. In this case, it's two three-speed automatic, uh, two three-speed gearboxes, one with a reverse and one without. Now, one gearbox handles first, third, and fifth gear. The other hand gearbox handles second, fourth, and sixth and one of the two handles reverse. I believe it's the 135 gearbox handles reverse, but I can't be sure. And what happens, and within the same casing, what happens is you have two clutches within the same housing. And you move away in first, first gear selected, it brings that clutch in. Now while you're accelerating, the computer of the car thinks, hmm, I'm accelerating, speed's going up, it's much more likely I'm gonna need second next, so it gets the second gearbox ready in second gear, absolutely, good to go and then what happens sort of you've got the two clutches one's engaged the other's open and it just goes like that and switches over between the two clutches that allows it to blend between first and second do so very very quickly and give an absolutely seamless seamless uh, transmission of power then of course the computer continually watches going on things hmm, going along and we're in second gear the speed's still increasing and I've still got the throttle on, I'm probably gonna need third next, or it might think, hang on, throttle's off, brakes are on, RPMs are going down, I'm gonna to need to go back into first, and it will just make, it will get the relevant gearbox queued up and ready, swap between them. That's in its essence, I mean, that's hugely simplified, but in essence, how a double clutch gearbox works. Upsides, continuous drive, there is never a break in drive. So on turbocharged engines, there's no drop off in power. So on a turbo diesel, they're brilliant, because you constantly maintain full boost under acceleration. Disadvantages, you still have a clutch. Uh, um, it's a newer technology, although so far they appear to have been extremely reliable with only one or two minor, minor issues, but they seem to have generally been extremely reliable and they generally have a good choice of gears. I mean, six is normal. Some of the smaller cars have seven speeds and some of the vans have seven speeds, but they're extremely reliable and the clutch actually runs in an oil bath in a lot of these cars. And that also helps extend the life of the gearbox and the clutch. I mean, clutches typically are doing 200,000 miles without a worry. They're barely a service part. They are replaceable. If a clutch goes on a double clutch, it's not the end of the world and you can replace the clutch. So that's the double clutch. It's rapidly becoming the standard, even in some bigger cars like the BMW 5 Series now, the new eight speed double clutches. Um, and it's, it's rapidly becoming the normal automatic gearbox, quite simply because it works. The next type is the epicyclic gearbox. Now this is what you call the traditional gearbox. These are in no particular order. And you had three speeds typically, some had two, some had four, but basically it revolves around what's called a planet and a sun gear, 
and effectively you have drums that are allowed to rotate freely. And when they're allowed to rotate freely, gear reduction is at its highest, and then there's a brake band that goes around this drum. When the next gear is required, one of these brake bands locks up, holds the drum still, and changes the gearing. And the order of these brake bands and the number of drums gives you a number of ratios. And that is, so the simplest form would be a two-speed epicyclic, such as a power glide that's still widely used in drag racing. And with the drum free, it's in one gear, the band locks up, that's the second gear, and that's it. It's effectively drive straight through, and that's it. So, that is the epicyclic. Um, they've got a lot of valves and solenoids, you have a pretty complicated valve body and they do need reasonably frequent oil changes because if any of those oilways block up or become dirty it can very adversely affect the operation of the gears. But other than that, that's all they are and that's, you know, that's how they work and they're quite effective. But the downside with the torque converter is they generate an awful lot of heat, a, a huge amount of heat. So if you're towing slowly uphill with the converter slipping, you can overheat and cook the gearbox quite easily. In the early days, that was overcome by using uh, an auxiliary transmission cooler. It was quite common, especially for American vehicles, to fit a large trans cooler, then you could tow more or less anything. Um, but also the advent of lock-up torque converters helped there as well, because the torque converter doesn't slip under normal conditions. Another one is a CVT. This was originally pioneered by DAF and uh, used on things like the Volvo 66 and the Volvo 340. And then it kind of went away, because originally it was two rubber bands, or rubber belts, with expanding cones. And one cone would contract, one cone would expand, and that changes the ratio between the two pulleys and gives you a continuously variable gearbox. In essence, it's fantastic, because you always have the perfect, perfect ratio for what you're doing, because there's no limit to the ratios you have. In practice, people didn't like the fact they always feel like they're slipping, even though they're not. And also, they, they do sometimes still employ a torque converter, uh, sometimes a roboticized clutch, but they also have issues, and it's not an issue, but a perceived reputation, they sound very droney. And the reason they sound very droney is because, for example, if you're towing and you're accelerating onto a motorway, even or sort of accelerating away from a standstill, if you're towing, you really want your peak torque. There's only one RPM that's going to happen at, so the car tends to go, oh, and sit there while the speed increases. People didn't like that. It's not a pleasant sound, especially with a diesel engine uh, or with the smaller four-cylinder petrol engines they were fitted with. And so the users didn't really accept them. They have recently had a renaissance though, because they are incredibly, incredibly efficient. They are absolutely remarkable for fuel economy um, because they can always be in the perfect ratio for economy as well. So they can always be in the highest ratio possible then the second you require a bit more power, they can lower the gearing ratio to suit. Now, they are becoming popular again in vehicles, like I said, such as Nissan Qashqai. There's a number of smaller cars, even some of the Honda Accords, the modern Accords over in the States actually have CVT gearboxes. But they're also a lot cheaper than double clutches, but they are probably on their way out in that respect. Quite a lot of the newer systems use chains instead of belts. Uh, Audi have used them for quite a long time, although their gearbox does have some issues. But if you see Sportronic or Steptronic on an Audi, the odds are as a CVT box. And the other type of gearbox we're going to talk about is a roboticized manual. And this is things like the Maserati Cambio Corsa, so the early BMW SMGs, and the Alfa Romeo Celispeeds. These are exactly, exactly what they sound like. It will be the self same gearbox as the manual version. It will be a normal five or six speed gearbox and all that happens instead of the usual when you have your gear lever that's connected to cables which move to gear change levers on the casing itself instead of the cable what they have is actuators they are just literally in effect solenoids and then a further actuator that actuates the clutch rod they have a clutch and they work in the same way as a normal manual transmission and then a computer decides to bring the clutch in and out and move the necessary actuators in principle it sounds very simple However, the actuators work on very, very high-powered hydraulics, uh, and that's where the issues and reliability issues weigh, uh, laid with them. They still have the problems of clutch wear, they still have the problems of having to get off the throttle, although the computer does that for you. It closes the throttle, actuates the clutch, moves the gear selectors, brings the clutch back in, brings the throttle back in. That's a slow process. That is not a fast process, and as a result, that is where problems with that gearbox light. You get no efficiency or performance benefits over a manual and you do have added complication. 
There's a couple of other things that particularly the Alfa Romeos were prone to. In the early days, people used to have problems with the actuators, and Alfa Romeo used to say, put a new actuator on, thousand pounds, thank you very much. Actually, they were rebuildable, and quite often it was only an O-ring that was required. And people that really knew what they were doing could rebuild the actuators for next to nothing and get the gearbox working for hundred pounds instead of a thousand. But of course, by the time that people had worked that out, everyone had realized that all oh, a thousand pounds if the gearbox goes don't like that risk and they got themselves a bad name and off they went um, the other thing that used to happen there was a very high pressure gearbox pump and that was triggered by a relay and that pump would click on and off about every 90 seconds or so and what would happen that you think how many clicks that is after a hundred thousand miles how many times that that relay's clicked in 90 seconds the relay used to burn out i heard more than one story of someone going out to buy an Alpha 156 with a knackered gearbox, going to it, looking at it, pulling the interior fan relay out, swapping it with the gearbox relay and driving the car home. Someone thought it was a thousand pound bill when it was a five pound relay. And uh, you imagine if you had been on the receiving end of that, as your car drove down the road perfectly, the, the owner's waving goodbye having bought it for next to nothing. I think I'd be in tears, that would just be horrendous. But yeah, so roboticized manuals are not great. So you think, okay, Let's go with a manual then. Well, that's not as simple anymore either. As diesels became more popular in the mid and late 90s, and even as much as the early 90s with the inception of the new technologies, people wanted diesel economy, but they wanted petrol smoothness and performance. Now that was fine, you could up the turbo pressure, common rail injection in the late 90s, the game pioneer, not pioneered by Alfa Romeo, gave you the power. But to get the smoothness, one of the things that was implied was called a dual mass flywheel. This is effectively a flywheel within a flywheel, separated by a rubber or silicon-based material. And it gives a damping effect, so the vibration at idle doesn't reach the cabin uh, or through the drive line. It gives a smoother acceleration, and it also smooths out gear changes if, you know, the heavier clutch on diesel can be a bit harsh if you bring it up a bit quickly. So it smooths out the drive line beautifully. Unfortunately, what towing does is load these up quite a lot. So the dual mass flywheel can suffer when towing uh, and can suffer from a lot of town driving as well. I've personally had to replace a clutch and dual mass flywheel assembly. It was a £1,600 bill, so it's not cheap. Um, dual clutch gearboxes don't seem to have them because obviously it has a computer to take out all the roughness that the, uh, that the dual mass was there primarily to remove. So really to wrap up, which is the best one to use? There isn't a straight answer. For me, I'm very much liking the dual clutch gearbox. Some people still steadfastly prefer manuals, but with the advent of hybrids, and bear in mind that hybrids are generally, almost always, CVT gearboxes. With the advent of hybrids, there will be fewer and fewer and fewer people with a driving license to drive a manual. So if you're buying a brand new car now and you've got the choice between a double clutch automatic and a manual, if you're going to keep this car five or six years, or even seven or eight years, I'd have to think very hard whether the manual's worthwhile because by the time you come to sell that car, that manual gearbox might be a real anchor around its neck because not that many people are going to have the license to drive it. So it's something you've got to consider. And the double clutch gearboxes now really are good. They've been around about 10 years and I've seen some with 400,000 miles on that have given no problems in taxis. So there were some issues with the earlier ones. Yes, there is still the chance something could go expensively wrong, but something could go expensively wrong with a manual. And in all honesty, I would suggest the risk of a clutch and dual mass flywheel replacement bill is probably higher than the risk of a problem with a double clutch gearbox. So right now, that's my gearbox of choice. Will this change as time goes on? Probably. But for now, that's what I'd go with. So sorry if this is a bit techy, but it's a topic I've been meaning to cover for a while. We're back out racing again in a couple more weeks, and that means the, car the old caravan's gonna come out again. So I might try and get a video up of that, although it's very hard to find the time to video at a race weekend, because obviously we're very busy racing. But the race bike's going great, we're going ever faster. We're looking for our first nine second passes any day now. We're down now to 10.20 at nearly 134 miles an hour, which when you think our first passes are in the 12 second region, is great news. So if you like these videos, hit the like and subscribe button. If you want to see more of the race bike and my moto vlog channel, go to Philo's Garage. That's on YouTube. So it's youtube.com forward slash Philo's Garage. I'll put a link up there for you. And uh, we'll see you soon. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. See you soon.